I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hey everybody, Chris Bumbray here again with another best movie you, well let's say, probably never saw. The Replacement Killers, starring Chow Yun-Fat in his first American big screen vehicle and a movie that I actually had the poster of on the door of my bedroom all throughout my teenage years. And this one, Chow Yun-Fat plays a Chinese triad assassin who has to grapple with his conscience when his boss orders him to kill the young son of a tenacious police officer played by the one and only Michael Rooker. Unable to go through with the assignment, he finds himself in the crosshairs of the LA underworld with a tough forger played by Mira Sorvino as his only ally. Now, in addition to Chai Fat, Mira Sorvino, and Michael Rooker, the bad guys in this movie are played by Danny Trejo, Till Schweiger, and Kenneth Zhang, and it has music by Harry Gregson Williams in one of his earliest scores, and it's directed in his feature film debut by Antoine Fuqua. Now, times have really changed. When The Replacement Killers was made, Antoine Fuqua, who was making his feature debut after several well-received music videos, which included the now famous Gangsta's Paradise by Coolio, was apparently struggling with Sony over the final edit for the film, with things between them getting really tense. 19 years later, Antoine Fuqua is one of their biggest directors, having made The Equalizer and The Equalizer 2 and The Magnificent 7 reboot for them, and recently signing an overall deal with the studio, guaranteeing that his association with them is long term. But it wasn't always this way. When The Replacement Killers was made, Fuqua's ambitions for the film were limited by the studio's desire for a quickie B-movie actioner. But even in its compromised form, with a theatrical cut only running 87 minutes, it stands as one of Chow Yun-Fat's better American movies. Fuqua had Hong Kong cinema down cold and knew how to present his iconic star, although the gun fu style action was still pretty new to audiences in 1998, with Chow Yun-Fat's old director John Woo having only recently caught on with his face-off only a few months earlier. Now, Chow Yun-Fat, at the time, was of course best known for his Hong Kong films like The Killer and Hard Boiled, both of which were directed by John Woo. And if you're a big fan of Hong Kong cinema like I am, you'll know that it goes a little bit deeper than that. He was also great in A Better Tomorrow 1 and 2, which are John Woo movies that aren't necessarily talked about quite as much, along with Once a Thief, which was more of a light-hearted Chai and fat movie, which is more what he was actually kind of like in Hong Kong as opposed to how he was cast in the US. Um, also, he did a lot of great movies with the late director Ringo Lam, including Prison on Fire 1 and 2, and The Great Full Contact, which stands as one of the most badass gangster movies of the 90s. And of course, there's also God and Gamblers 1 and Return of God of Gamblers. And in fact, the series is still kind of going on right now with the movies that Chai and Fat's making with Wong Jing called From Vegas to China and all those terrible movies, I have to say, all being in a way continuations of the God of Gamblers series. But I digress a lot. Chai and Fat, for all of his talent, and the fact that he got a couple of really strong starring vehicles, including this and The Corrupter, and even the prestigious Anna and the King co-starring Jodie Foster, never really was able to catch on with American audiences in the kind of movies that he made in Hong Kong. He soon found himself starring in martial arts movies like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which coincidentally was probably his biggest hit ever, and Bulletproof Monk, despite distinctly not being a martial artist. It's a shame that Chai Yun Fat was pigeonholed because I think back in the 90s they saw a Chinese lead and they just figured, oh, he must be good at Kung Fu. I mean, obviously that's not the case and he was never allowed to do anything but do Kung Fu, even if it was something that didn't come naturally to him. And it's a real shame that he was pigeonholed because Chai Yun Fat was probably one of the most charismatic actors of his era and an icon worldwide, seemingly everywhere except for North America, although he definitely has a huge cult of fans here as well. And I have to say, Chai Yun Fat, to this day, is definitely not suffering because he's still one of the most popular actors in China despite being in his 60s, with his movies routinely ranking among the top grosses of the year. Although I have to say, 
I haven't really been a huge fan of his output as of late since Let the Bullets Fly, just because his movies are catered towards a distinctly Chinese market, and they all kind of embrace this really zany vibe that I don't think translates very well, although the movies are still making a ton of money. And Chai Yun Fat, I have to say, is a pretty generous guy, with him recently announcing that he was giving all of his money away to charity. What a guy. He lives on less. He's somebody that I think a lot of American actors could look up to as someone who actually tries to make the world around him a better place. But again, I digress. One of the reasons that The Replacement Killers is a good movie is that Antoine Foucault not only knew about Chow Yun-Fat's history with John Woo and appreciated that, but the fact is he actually really liked Chow Yun-Fat as a person, with him saying in an Ain't It Cool News interview years later that Yun-Fat was one of those guys that I admired watching every day because he was so calm and comfortable and friendly. He was just a good person. And one day I was in my trailer just frustrated and upset about a lot of different things. And I remember saying something to Chow like, how come you're so calm about the process of making movies? And he said something like he was just comfortable being Chow and fat just being who he was. It wasn't any put on and he wasn't trying to be a movie star. He was just really comfortable as a human being, just cool as shit. Everything about him was just cool and I couldn't figure out why he was that way. He was like, I've been through all that and I've come to the conclusion in my life that I'm really comfortable being Chow and I'm not trying to be anyone else. It was one of those things that really stuck with me, for me as a person, not just as a director. You need to get really comfortable with who you are and just roll with that. I'm not trying to hurt anybody or be an asshole or be the screaming mad director that people may want you to be. Just be who you are. And I have to say, it was really good advice and a great lesson for Fuqua to learn because it's helped him have an amazing career as probably one of the top action directors in the world and a guy that I've interviewed a bunch of times. And I have to say, always a pleasure to talk to. He's a really knowledgeable film guy and he's always fun. He doesn't take himself too seriously. I think that's the reason why Antoine Fuqua has stuck around for such a long time. Although he's made some pretty amazing movies. Now, for what it was, The Replacement Killers did pretty well at the box office. It only made $20 million domestic, which was below its $30 million budget, but I reckon that after foreign box office, they more than broke even, and it became a solid hit on DVD with Sony re-releasing it many times, making it a staple of their catalog. They even released it on the short-lived UMD format, which, if anybody knows, was for PSP, PlayStation Portable, which was a thing for a while. For some reason, studios seemed to think that people were just gonna watch movies on their devices on little discs. This thing called the iPhone came along and, well, kind of ruined things for PSP. Fuqua, after another flop with the movie Bait, starring Jamie Foxx, which I also think is kind of underrated, finally found its niche with Training Day and has since become, I have to say, one of the most solid directors that's out there. I don't know if I'd call The Replacement Killers a great movie, but it's definitely a fun movie. It's certainly imitative of Chai Yun Fat's movies with John Woo, with him essentially playing the same guy that he played in The Killer. And the carnage never quite approaches the symphonic levels of something like Hard Boiled, but as far as American Hong Kong movie clones go, it's definitely one of the best. This is mostly thanks to Chai Yun Fat's absolute charm and Antoine Fuqua's style, which he really did tailor to his star. Again, Fuqua really liked Chai Yun Fat, and he showcases him in the best light possible. You can really tell that him and the crew appreciate their star because they make him look, as Fuqua said, cool as shit throughout. The movie is full of low angle hero shots, and I have to say, Chai Yun Fat looks probably the best that he looked outside of his Hong Kong movies. He's in great shape, and he looks, you know, fresh faced and ready to take on Hollywood. Although, one of the negatives is that it's undeniable that his English at the time was kind of limited, so they kind of make him the strong silent type. Which is funny if you watch his Hong Kong movies because he's really not the strong silent type. He's actually very talkative in his films and kind of zany. They couldn't really do that because his English just wasn't there at the time. I still need papers. Yeah, great. But, you know, it really picked up over the years. And uh, if they were to do another movie with him in North America, I think that, you know, Chai and Fat could still nail it. Now, his chemistry with Mira Sorvino suffers a little bit because they can't really have a lot of dialogue scenes together. But what's really funny is that for some reason they decided not to make these two photogenic sexy actors have a romance. And I think one of the reasons is that in the 90s, interracial relationships in movies were still pretty rare. And I remember hearing that Murder at 1600 had love scenes between Wesley Snipes and Diane Lane that were cut out. And I think that really dates the movie in kind of a nasty way. I mean, there's no way that these two beautiful people would be slammed together in this carnage-filled world and, you know, not get it on. What's really funny too is that Mira Savino apparently got along great with Chai Yun-Fat because she can actually speak Cantonese. 
She also gave Fuqua high marks saying in a random Rolls AV Club interview that I really loved working with Antoine and it was fun to do an action movie. It was kind of like being a kid playing cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers and I enjoyed the role of Meg. I thought she was fun to do. I blew out my voice when I was doing a reshoot of Mimic because it was one of those screaming scenes where I'm in the subway and I'm yelling because a monster is coming. And when I came to the set of The Replacement Killers, Antoine was like, ooh, I like your voice that way, keep it. So every day I had to yell to burn out my vocal cords. My voice wasn't the same for a year and a half afterwards because it had a rough, gravelly, two registers lower sound to it. So yeah, she does sound kind of different, come to think of it. You must be kidding, I'm not going anywhere with you. You're like a walking goddamn bullseye. Yeah, I got a great sense of humor. That's something you're gonna find out about me. I'm funny and I can take a joke. You know, a lot of people can't take a joke. And I have to say, Servino really does seem game in an action movie, and you'd think after watching this, why is it the Mira Servino wasn't able to parlay her success in this movie into a bunch of action roles? I mean, I could have easily seen her in the Mila Jovovich mold. Unfortunately, she was blacklisted by that asshole Harvey Weinstein because she wouldn't sleep with him. So, once again, fuck Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> Now with Chai and Fat not saying a lot in this movie, Miro Savino kinda has to handle most of the exposition, so in some ways her role is almost bigger than his. And another person who arguably benefits from this all is Michael Rooker, in a rare sympathetic part as the targeted cop whose son has been marked for death by the Chiad, and he chases after Chai and Fat thinking that Chai and Fat is coming to kill his son, not knowing that Chai and Fat is actually trying to protect his son. And he gets a lot more screen time here than you'd think. Now the movie also has really cool villains, Danny Trejo and Till Schweiger, as actually the titular characters, the so-called replacement killers, while Hong Kong actor Kenneth Zhang, who turned up in The Killer and a bunch of other movies from the era, is really cool and collected as the triad boss who wants his own son avenged. Now the movie probably could have done with a little more levity, and I think that was a bit of a failing of Fuqua's at first because his movies were always really heavy. He only really kind of developed a lighter style as his career went on. Even Bait, which is kind of an action comedy, is surprisingly dark. I think that Fuqua just at that time didn't really like to joke around, although he's really definitely livened things up quite a bit. The only kind of comic relief in this movie comes from a very young Clifton Collins Jr., who has probably the only funny bits as one of the underworld snitches. But it all adds up to Fuqua's undeniable film noirish tone. And I have to say, the soundtrack by Harry Gregson Williams, with this being his first solo assignment after working on The Rock with Hans Zimmer and Nick Glennie Smith, is propulsive, and the overall look of the movie is really seedy. And I have to say, the quick running time, with it running under 90 minutes, really makes it an easy film to just plop in and rewatch time and time again. And I have to say, the best scene in this movie, and probably the most distinctly 1990s scene in the movie, is Chai and Fat's intro, which I think rivals some of his John Woo films, as he walks into a nightclub to the Crystal Method, which I have to say, was an absolute staple of films in the era, even turning up in Lost in Space. And that music is great. And he even does kind of a nifty little bullet ballet, like out of a John Woo movie, eliminating his targets and never even getting a single hair out of place. And the way that he spins around and his red tie rests on his gun arm is really cool. Now, I think this movie should have immediately established him as a stylish, cool Asian action icon in North America, but sadly, audiences at the time seemingly just weren't ready for it. And you know what? We need a Chai Yun Fat for the 21st century. I mean, you know, how about John Cho? Give him a call. I think he'd be awesome as an action star. Good news, The Replacement Killers, if you haven't seen it, is easily available with it out on DVD and Blu-ray and many streaming sites, including Sony's Crackle, if you want to see it for free and legal. And it's also in Canada, available for free, legally, of course, on the CTV Go app. So check it out. It's not a classic, but The Replacement Killers is a cool Chai and Fat movie. One hopes that before he calls it a day, Chai and Fat will get one last big action to go out on. And I have to say, there have been rumors for years that him and John Woo are having a feud. And if that's true, if he really cannot work with John Woo again, then you know what? Antoine Fuqua would be a great choice to take on the mantle and send him out in a way that does his legend justice and rescue him from all those shitty Wan Jing movies that he's making that are playing off the success of God of Gamblers. So, until next time, for JoeBlow.com, I'm Chris Bumray, and you know what? 
Now, as we're all self-quarantining, I've got a couple of extra bonus recommendations for you Chai and Fat fans out there. If by chance you've seen this video, you watched the movie and you loved it and you want to know some other good Chai and Fat movies to check out, or if you happen to have seen this movie and it's another one of the best movies that you never saw that you actually have seen and you're all angry with me, here are a couple of movies that you should check out to further your knowledge of Hong Kong action cinema. Now, if you're into John Woo and you're into Chai and Fat, you have to watch all of their collaborations. A Better Tomorrow 1 and 2 are terrific. A Better Tomorrow 3 definitely has its moments, but it was directed by Choi Hark, who doesn't quite know the heroic bloodshed genre like John Woo does. Definitely watch The Killer, which is a masterpiece. It's hard for me to make a decision between Hard Boiled and The Killer as to what's the better John Woo movie. I think Hard Boiled probably has more action and bigger set pieces, but something about The Killer really just kind of gets me. I love both those movies though, and you can't go wrong. Also check out Once a Thief, which is a much sillier movie than the other John Woo Chai and Fat collaborations, but is a lot of fun, has some good action, and also has a good performance by Leslie Chung, who is also a great Hong Kong legend who unfortunately died a couple years ago. He's also great in The Bride with White Hair and The Bride with White Hair 2, which are directed by Ronnie Yu, who went on to direct Bride of Chucky. If you want to watch a couple of more good heroic bloodshed movies, you should look up the career of Andy Lau, who's still a huge star in Hong Kong and actually did a couple of really good ones of his own, including a few with Chai and Fat, including Rich and Famous and Tragic Hero, which I have to say are definitely not even close to being as good as John Woo movies, but are still kind of fun in their own low budget way. Chai and Fat also did a couple of other fun movies, including Peace Hotel, which has a really great premise and could easily be remade as a Western, I think, and one really good shootout towards the end, which I hear was actually ghost directed by John Woo. Unfortunately, John Woo's movies lately have tapered off since he was really big in North America. Red Cliff 1 and 2 are terrific, and watching that together is excellent. The Crossing I haven't seen. I've heard it's not great. I have to say, though, I was not a fan of his latest bullet ballet movie, Manhunt, which I have to say has some cool action, but would have been way better with somebody like Chai and Fat in the lead. Although, if you want to check it out yourself, it's a Netflix original, so give it a look. Until next time, everybody, for JoeBlow.com, I'm Chris Bumbray.